well, it's a great day because there's another episode of Scouting the Cities. It's coming across your TV, your phone, in your ears, in your car. It doesn't matter. It's here. It's Scouting the Cities. And today we've got Lisa Richardson, a pro captioner. Hmm, what is that, you may ask? Well, you're about to find out. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit right now. So, a pro captioner, she does the closed captioning, what you see in those black bars that come across the bottom of your TV screen on the Jumbotron at the Minnesota Wild, Minnesota Timberwolves, Minnesota Twins, St. Thomas Graduation, even. Those bars with words of what people are saying, well, that's Lisa. It is a job that she's been working in for quite some time, and she's got a plethora of experience, and that experience brought her to a St. Thomas commencement ceremony. She was working on the Saturday of commencement. There's two days, Saturday and Sunday, here at the University of St. Thomas, and someone else was also working. Guess what? It was me, Scout Mason, host of Scouting the Cities. I was working, I was running a camera, and, you know, I started asking some questions to Lisa, who was in this sort of area all on her own with this weird machine that was up at about her hip height. It looked like that she was typing on with one, two hands, and then she had her laptop set up, and that's when I realized, okay, she's you know, putting these speeches up on our screen, because we had two screens up, um, captioning for people. So I started asking questions as I do, and as you'll hear in this episode, and if you keep listening to the Scouting the Cities podcast, you're going to keep hearing me ask questions, but this is in everyday life, not recorded. So I started asking questions, and I found that Lisa, as I asked more questions, was starting to really get into it. You could tell she loved what she did, and she was very passionate about it. And so I popped the question, didn't get down on a knee or anything, but I said, Lisa, would you like to be on my podcast, the Scouting the Cities podcast, which I've now said quite a few times in this intro. Um, I hope you enjoy that I'm saying my podcast name. It's not. We're not going in the episode quite yet. So... Now we got Lisa on and an amazing guest. You get to hear all the stories, all the behind the scenes of what she does. And she brought her um, machine in and shows us how to use it. And what can be better than that? Visual learning here on the Scouting the Cities podcast. But it was great to to hear this. And after the podcast, um, Lisa immediately, as we finished, said, Scout, you're really good at asking questions. So that made me think, okay, I should probably tell you my background of how I started asking questions because this is what I told Lisa. I, I, I don't think I'm necessarily, I'm tooting my own horn here. Yeah, I'm good at asking questions. I don't know if I'm like astounding at it. I think I, I can ask a good question here and there. And you know why? It's because my dad and my mom, uh, both of them, but um, largely my dad, I remember him saying, like, always ask questions whenever I'm going over to a friend's house for a sleepover, whenever I'm at a, you know, party, an an event, always ask questions. Um, My dad has told me, you know, there was, uh, whenever we'd go to, like, one of these adult gatherings, you know, not a lot of kids are going, but I was the kid who was in the conversation with the adults because I was asking questions because that's what my dad instilled in me. And that's what I told Lisa after this episode. You know, my, my dad is a reporter uh, in North Carolina on TV. So I guess that that had something to do with it, too. But I just remember him always urging to ask a question and even to the point where when our family would invite someone else over to our house or maybe even we were at a party at at the end of the night you know they leave the outsiders leave and the family gathers together have our little breakdown I'm sure you know and a lot of the times it was like yeah they were nice didn't ask me a single question though we started judging people because they weren't asking questions 
Um, so I guess that's why I'm curious. That's why I'm asking these questions here on the Scouting the Cities podcast. We'll hit it again, baby. Um, and yeah, I guess that's just I was kind of raised that way. It was an interesting thing that Lisa posed to me, and, and it made me think, and I think it's a, a good tidbit to touch on before this episode starts, because I don't know, you're going to hear me ask a lot of questions, and that's who I am, baby. I like to ask me some questions, and I do a lot in this episode with Lisa Richardson. It's a great one. I really hope you enjoy, because I, I really did enjoy it, and I hope you learned something, and maybe, just maybe one person out there watching this podcast becomes the next Lisa Richardson. We hope so. But enjoy this episode of Scouting the Cities. So, Lisa Richardson, a um, closed captionist, is that what it's called? Closed captioner is what we prefer. Um, Captionist came from when the days when they were doing type well, which is kind of a it's the short form of taking notes and things, but not getting every word like we do. Yeah. So a closed captioner here in Minnesota. Yes. So first, how did you even get into this industry? Was it just through <laughs> experience? Like, who did someone tell you? Like, hey, there's this thing going on. Try it out. Um, it's a great story. Um, I wanted to be a teacher when I graduated. I was going to go to St. Cloud State and go be a teacher. And my grandmother was like, no. You won't make enough money. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. And and then I was just, and my parents were like, no, you're not going to St. Cloud. You know, it's too much of a party school. And I'm like, okay, fine. Now what? And my grandmother was living in San Francisco at the time, and she sent me an ad from the Boston Globe that was advertising court reporting. Oh, wow. And this was back in the days before computers even. And I kind of looked at it, and it had all of these wonderful things, how much money you could make, how little school you had to go to. And so I had somebody come out from um, what was then the Minnesota School of Business, and because they had a court reporting program and he came out and he had all these wonderful things to say. And so I signed up and I started two weeks after I graduated from high school. Yeah. So where was that school located? It was downtown Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Um, It's where city center is now. Um, So yeah, I was just, I went downtown to go to school and then I had a couple of jobs down at different places down there. And in between, there was a really cool bar. I can't remember the name of it right now, but they had um, foosball tables. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so, it was so, perfect. <laughs> so closed captioning and foosball, right? Well, and at that time, it was just court reporting. Captioning mm-hmm. wasn't even around. And okay. so I moved to, once I graduated, I moved to Florida and did court reporting for there for 13 years. And then I came back here for a, a court reporting convention. And captioning was just starting. This is 1988. Um, there were about six stations on the air at that point with captioning. And um, Care 11 had just gotten had just had gotten all the equipment and wanted to start closed captioning, and they contacted this one court reporting company that was here. He happened to run into me at the convention talking to a colleague, and, and he's like, "Well, did you ever think about moving back?" And I said, "Yeah, all the time, you know, kind of smarty." Mm-hmm. And he told me what he had, and so I thought about it overnight, and I thought, "Yeah, it's time to come home." And um, we ended up being the eighth station on the air in the country, and then we ended up about a year into it. Um, they got a computer newsroom system with a grant from Carlson Companies and a couple of others. And um, they got that in, and we were the first ones to integrate live closed captioning with the newsroom computer system. And then another year later, and they decided to just go with the newsroom computer system and didn't need us anymore. So that's when I got out into the world and started doing um, CART, which is similar to captioning, but it doesn't have the video behind it. It's not Mm -hmm. like you see on TV. This CART is where we sit in a classroom or say there was a person who had a hearing loss here and you and I were talking, I had a hearing loss, somebody could be sitting right in front of me writing everything that's being said and I can be reading it on a screen. So we do a lot of that stuff. Um, Yeah, so that's... important work too. It is. I mean, it is. There are a lot of things that we do. um, We've got some... We've got a few pretty high high up there clients. Um, One... One in particular is a world-renowned professor, and I've worked with him a lot. And we've done, he did a world, world conference about 10 years ago, and he wanted to stream it around the world. And he's like, okay, Lisa, can you do it? And I'm like, uh, yeah. And so we did it. Um, we had it streaming around the world. And he's had several of these. The, the later ones have been like in Africa or um, India, places like that where it's just impossible to do it from. But yeah, so it's really... You know, we're helping people get through school. We um, we just had a student graduate from another college, and my colleagues had all worked with that particular um, student, and they just got to see him graduate. 
That's awesome. So, yeah, it's really cool because without that, without captioning or cart, he wouldn't have been able really to, to learn what he did learn. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's why I'm so passionate about it now um, because I've seen people, I've captioned weddings. I captioned a friend of mine's wedding. And, you know, and to be able to see everybody being able to participate, it, I always get tears. Okay, so I have a really cool story. Yes, go ahead. So um, we, we still do this. We caption for, there's a Hearing Loss Association of America, mm -hmm. and they have a chapter meeting every, the third Saturday of every month. And this was way in the beginning. Um, I think I'd been captioning for like just a couple of years, had just gotten let go by Care 11. So I'm trying to find my way in this yeah. world. And... Um, uh, I knew some other deaf people that were in another group. And so they had a, a joint group with an author and it was really fun. And then this, the HLAA group were like, well, can you do that for our meetings? And so I said, sure. Anyway, I did it for several years, but one of the times that I still will, I, it's just so blazed in my memory. Um, I, it was a day I didn't want to go. I was living in Eden Prairie. The church was downtown where we had, you know, it was Saturday morning. I didn't want to go. And I was just cranky, and I got there, and I'm setting up, and everybody's really nice. Once you got there, it's, it's yeah, kind of yeah, cool. Yeah. You know, you're like, okay, I'm among friends. Is this a wedding? No, this was a, just a chapter meeting okay. for the Hearing Loss for the Association. He yes, uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. And there were these two new women there that I'd never seen before, and they were hanging back in, in the back of the room, and very quiet, seemed very shy. And they had introduced themselves, and um, anyway, the meeting goes on. It's a two-hour meeting. We end up. We, we finish, and I'm packing all my stuff up, and I'm, and I'm feeling better than I had. Anyway, they come up to me, they introduce themselves again to me, and they were crying. And then they made me cry because they were said, you know, we can't tell you how much we appreciated you being here. We've never been able to be in a setting like this and know what was going on or what was being said. Oh, wow. I lost it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I will never be cranky about this job again. <laughs> um, and, you know, because I've never forgotten that too, because, and they went on to flourish. One of them started a library within that whole chapter. Um, she now travels around the world. Her sister is, is a little bit more reserved, but they both got cochlear implants. I mean, they just really blossomed and turned into people that they hadn't been because they'd never had the opportunity. I mean, yeah, that's, that's amazing, right? Like that really shows you like, I, I, when I, when I first talked to you, I, t I told you, and I, I've said it a few times, like, this is a job, like not many people think about, right? right. I, I didn't, I honestly probably had never thought about it until I saw you at the St. Thomas graduation and everything. Um, but it is really impactful when you do think about it. You, you, you realize how many people are in need of this service. And like that story just shows you like, yeah. how impactful it can be and, and can help people learn, like you said, with the, with the college student as well. Um, so you grew up here in Minnesota. Yes. Uh, yep. Um, and then coming back to CARE 11, w w w were you excited to be back home and everything and, and get to work here? I was, yeah, because my, my mom and my sister were here. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad had passed away in the meantime. So, you know, p part of me was thinking I should come back home. And Florida's great, or it was back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, this was a long time ago. It, it was really great, but I saw things were changing, too. And um, I thought, you know, maybe it's time to go home. And then when I came back for the convention and got offered this job, I'm like, well, I had said <laughs> if something really cool comes up, yeah, I'll think about it dropped in my lap, you know, so how can you say no to mm -hmm. that? Um, and so, yeah, I was really glad to be back home. Um, I came back in 88 when, um, a long time ago, but there was like a huge drought that year. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then it got cold right away. And I'm like, okay, why did I come back here? But it was also, it was the next year, I think then that the twins won. Well, it was within a couple of years that the twins won the second series. Mm -hmm. I got to be at that because I was working at Care 11 and knew some people who had tickets. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I got to be at the two la the two first games and the two last games. Oh, that's awesome. I know. I, I lucked out on that one. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad I came back because mm -hmm. this has just been, um, this is what I, I really believe this is what I was meant to do. That's awesome. I mean, that's that's amazing. And that's like that's the type of people I'm looking for for this podcast, right? People who have found something they love. So um, you mentioned how you started with court reporting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, can you explain what that was like, um, you know, uh, uh, both working cases and, and how it worked, like what you needed to do in order to be a successful court reporter? Oh, sure. Um, well, I worked in... Down in Florida, I worked in a couple of different capacities. First, I started out just as an, an independent contractor, freelance 
court reporter, uh -huh. where I would just get assignments from the woman I worked with or for and would go to different law offices. Um, and that was always an interesting experience because we never know from day to day what we're getting into. Even with carton captioning, where we might have an agenda, we often don't, but you know, we don't always know what we're getting into. And so depos, depositions in particular are really, they can be really difficult, they can be really trying, they can be really funny. Um, I've got one story that I don't think I should probably tell, but um, it, it was just one of those that went from horrible, worst job ever to, and it was a series of three days, and then to the, the last day, all of us are in tears, we're laughing so hard about stuff. You know, it was just one of those. Um, and so being in Florida was really cool. I worked also in the court system down there for a couple of years and then went back into freelance because that's what I like the best. I yeah. like being able to have a little bit of control over what I do. Um, and so, you know, for court reporting, you're doing depositions for all the pretrial stuff. Um, and often, you know, we would go to doctor's offices taking, you know, lots of, that's how I learned I had carpal tunnel sy syndrome. I was taking a doctor's deposition at 7 a.m. on a Monday morning, hadn't slept much because my hands kept buzzing. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the case we were talking about was carpal tunnel. And I looked at him, I'm like, seriously? <laughs> and sure enough, that was, I had carpal tunnel. Wow. So, I mean, those are the things too that we learn. Yeah. Sometimes it's really bizarre. Um, but yeah, it's just, so, you know, in court reporter, as a court reporter, you can, if you want to work for a court system, you certainly can. Right now, our courts are dying. Um, we need desperately, we, I think I told you this, so there's a 15% shortage of court reporters across the country. It's not just here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is across the country. Um, there are some places like Chicago where they, they can't get enough reporters, so they're having to turn to digital or to voice writers, which you know, is a voice writer is when you're talking into it and then it comes out, mm -hmm. um, which I had, don't have a problem with as long as they can do as good of a job as we can. That. I'm fine with that. It's the digital. It's the artificial intelligence. And so the more we were allowing that to take over for us because there aren't enough of us, the worse it gets. On the other hand, there are things that I do that AI is never going to be able to do. So um, that's that's one thing I really want to stress is it's such an awesome job. We really want to get the word out about it's not just court reporting and we're not going to be replaced in the next 15 years. Um, it's just, it's, it really is very important, too, for the judicial system that if you, um, you know, to have a, a verbatim, honest transcript. Um, here's one quick court reporting story. I did a daily copy, which is you do a trial, and, and one side of, this was the defendants in that case. They're, they had a court reporter that was there for the, court, for the county. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but the defense, and it was a big, expensive case um, for harvester, Mm, silos and um and there was a lot of money at stake and so the defense attorney it was the harvester people they wanted court reporters in there to do daily copies so that they could look at the transcripts every night and so another colleague and i split that so i drove down to rochester every day and drove back to then caption a show for san antonio texas every night um it but it was really kind of fun too and um but the judge wouldn't allow he had a, a voice a tape recording courtroom and mm -hmm. he was like you're to be seen and not heard you can't ask the witness to repeat anything we've got it all on tape okay unfortunately for the judge and for their electronic recorder there were two very important hearings that were held in the judge's chambers that weren't recorded and the case kind of depended on a couple of his rulings and they didn't have the arguments oh. they yeah anyway um it was really you know it was kind of like well see Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know what ever happened. I was just, I stayed out of it. But you know, I've always used that argument that here's what happens if you you're trusting somebody to turn on the tape recorder. It should be easy. Not always. You know, sometimes I make mistakes too. So sometimes I don't hear something correctly or I will interrupt. Um I don't do that so much in carton captioning, but um, because too, we, we can always, we don't have to be as verbatim. I know that sounds really silly, but when you're, when you're a court reporter, you have to have every word. Mm -hmm. It just, no ifs, ands, or buts. And a lot of people do use tape backups these days, which I wish I'd had when I was brand new reporter. I could have used it. <laughs> but these days with carton captioning, um, too, sometimes I want to make sure that the person who, especially if I'm in a class or a meeting or something. I want to make sure that the person I'm there for understands what's being said. And if there's a really big word or word I don't know, I but I know the meaning of, I'll substitute another word so that they get the point. 
um, so that they can understand what's being said instead of me sitting there fumbling around and then losing what's being said. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it, that's what's really, those are the differences, I guess. So you mentioned, um, I, I feel like looking at this, this job at face value, it's very easy for someone who's looking at it just on the outside looking in. This could be easily replaced by AI, right? But you say, you, you know that you know the industry better than probably as or as well as anybody else, right? So, can you explain why like there are things that AI can't do that you can? Okay, yeah, Let, I'd be happy yeah. to. Um, I don't know if you watch the local news, mm -hmm. but the local news stations have gone away from using a live captioner. They're like. I, I tend to watch Care 11 and CCO a lot, and there are certain shows where they do have a real captioner, a, a human captioner. Are you able to tell when you're watching? Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. um, here's how you can tell. So first of all, if, if it's AI, um, you can tell because it's all one lines, They, and oftentimes it's spotty and things are kind of weird. Um, if it's a live human captioner, um, they will have punctuation will end a line, and then the next line we'll start the new sentence so that there's some breakage in there. So you can see, okay, this is the end of the sentence. Here's the new sentence. Mm -hmm. If a new person is talking, we have these little chevrons. So you get the little things to the right that say, okay, this means a different person is talking. That way people can tell, at least watching the news, they may not be able to quite tell who's talking, but they can see who's talking. Um, that's the other thing. When I'm on a job, a lot of my clients, especially even with Zoom, um, we do a lot of Zoom these days. And in, you know, the windows get yellow. They have the yellow frame when, when you're talking. But that still doesn't mean that the person is going to be able to see who's talking right away. And so if they're deaf or hard of hearing and on, on the other end of that, if people don't say who they are, they don't know who's speaking. And so a lot of times AI won't be able to tell you, but I know the voices and I know the meeting that I'm in because I've got a list of all the people and I can put the name. So I'll put the chevrons and then I'll write the name and then I'll write what's being said. Mm -hmm. So that way the person who's depending on this, can always tell who's, who's talking. Um, other things is, I don't know if you really watch the captioning on the local channels, uh, but what I find humorous but very frustrating is they don't even seem to have trained their AI to know their own reporters' names. I, you know, I wish I'd, I should have written a couple, of, a couple of them down, but so I'm looking at it going, what? How did you even get that out of what was said? Um, and then it's real choppy. It'll stop. Now all of a sudden it'll come up. Now sometimes that's a new captioner too, who just gets so far behind they're freaking out, and I've been there and done that. Yeah. So um, I don't want to come down too hard on them. Um, but yeah, that. So there's just so many. There's so many things with AI. Um, another example: we have uh, several clients who have different accents. Um, especially there's several who have deaf accents. They they were born deaf. Um, they grew, have obviously grown up deaf, but they also grew up in the audio world or learning to lip read. Um, and, and some of them have gone to um, speech class so that they could learn to talk. And many of them talk fairly well, but they can still be sometimes hard to discern exactly what they're saying. Um, you know, it's the same if you have somebody from Britain, you know, they yeah. kind of talk weird too. So, you know, every once in a while you're like, what? Um, I can at least ask them, or we have one in particular, I, I say this person has three accents, and um, it's really very difficult to understand, but I can always stop the person and say, whoa, stop, I don't know what you're saying, and I'm trying to help the interpreters too, because if I don't understand, they probably don't, mm -hmm. and so we'll just say, okay, stop, start over, look at me, tell me what you're talking about, okay, go. Because they get so excited. I mean, when you get upset or you're, you kind of like me get really excited about something, um, you tend to talk really fast. And if you have an accent or two or three, um, it gets to be next to impossible. And you want to make sure that the other people are understanding what's being said because mm -hmm. that's not fair to them and it's not fair to the person speaking. AI couldn't do that. There's no way AI could stop and say, excuse me, can you repeat that? don't think that's going to happen, yeah. nor will it happen in court. The judge doesn't know if the reporter's getting it or not. The judge doesn't know if AI is getting it. Sometimes they don't care because they figure it'll be in the transcript later on. Yeah, and then when they get back to the transcript, it's totally botched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right there. So, um, and I've worked with these like AI or um, I guess it's AI um, like a as um, before a, a hockey game when I do play-by-play -play or, or something, I'm interviewing the coach on this app, um, Otter. So oh yeah, I heard yes. about it. Yeah, so I'm I'm using Otter on my phone, um, 
And I really rely on that to try and like get me in a right spot, but it is real botchy and I have to check before because I'm just trying to pull quotes. You know, it's an hour and a half, two hours before the game. I'm trying to like get this quick because I got a million other things to do to prepare before the game. But yeah, you're right. It is choppy and definitely with the accents. If, if there's a coach who, you know, is an American or, you know, just maybe even a little too Minnesotan, right? <laughs> like, there is that, yeah. Yeah. Um, it gets a little confusing. You mentioned a deaf accent. It, can you explain? That's what I call it, mm-hmm. um, because there's there's a lack of tonality to their to their voice because they can't hear themselves speak. Mm-hmm. So I can always hear myself speak, and so I you know I guess there's an ebb and a flow when you're speaking, especially depending on where your mood is at the time. Yeah. Um, but most of the the deaf people I know, it, it it's a little nasally. It's hard to describe. I have one one. Um, consumer who he gets mad he got mad at me he asked me don't don't you think I have this kind of an accent and I said no he said well what kind of an accent do you think I have and I said I think you have a deaf accent he's like and to this day 10 years later Mm -hmm. he still gives me grief over that but (laughs) and and I can't it's hard to describe because they're not all exactly the same but there is a tonality to it Mm -hmm. a little bit nasally um and sometimes some words aren't you don't know how the syllables are spelled you know, or spoken. Um, you see a word and, and you think it should be, because you know our language, you know, our alphabet is so weird. Um, and so you're looking at a word and you think it's going to be this. And then, and so they're saying it like that. And I'm looking at them going, oh, I bet they mean this. Where this, you know, the structure is totally set up differently than they think it is. So, yeah. you know, or the, the long A isn't a long A, it's a short A. So it, yeah. And this one particular customer, he's all, he always is, is that, are we saying, how do you pronounce that? Am I saying that right? So, you know, I, but I, that's where I get the chance too to be able to write it out and say, this is how you pronounce it. I have it. to ask that myself and I can hear myself a lot. So <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure that's tough. Um, so would you say like you're able to distinguish accents pretty well too, just from experience? Or like distinguish. I can tell people, voices. I yeah. If I hear a voice that I've worked with, um, it don't even have to see him. So, okay, so we do um, a show for um, the Minnesota Senate, and um, it's called Capitol Report, and they have all the legislators on it. We also caption for the legislature mm-hmm. when they're in session, and we've been doing that for twenty um, something years now. So I know until we get the new people in, but there are a lot of voices that I know. And so every time I go to do the show, they always run through it and I always say, okay, who's on? And so then they'll play the snippets and they make me guess who, mm-hmm. who the person is. And eight times out of 10, I get it because yeah. we're just so tuned into the voices. Um, I can be walking down the street and I'll hear a voice. And I'm like turning around going, I know that voice. And people think I'm nuts, you know, but it, yeah, I, accents. Hmm. Not so much. I'm there are a few I'm just not good at at all. But like um, Australian, um, England, mm-hmm. even some with a French accent, I I can do okay with. But yeah, it gets you get some of the accents. I'm like I have no clue. I'm sure it's all just experience too. Mm-hmm. Like just just learning, or, or just if you've worked with someone with a French accent, then. You start to pick up on it a little bit more. Especially when you work with them rep- repeatedly. Yeah, yeah. You know, then it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, you start to get the hang of it and stuff. So, yeah, it's it, but it's really interesting. And mm-hmm. you start to learn the lingo of certain jobs that you do, like with the legislature. You know, we, we kind of know their lingo. Um, so we kind of sometimes know what they're going to say or very close to it. They've got a lot of stock phrases like, um, well, it's bill for an act. And when they were introducing a bill, and they'll just run through it, the both secretaries just go flying by. And so we've got some macros too that we use, so that instead of you know writing out the whole thing, we have we just do a, a macro for it, so that it all comes up at once. Yeah. So you mentioned a few times this um, what cape is that or, or uh, the cart cart? Sorry. Yes. Communication cart. access real time translation mm-hmm. is what the acronym stands okay. for. Okay. And so is that. What, what is that? Is that like what, what type of entity is that? So that's basically the same as captioning, mm-hmm. except we don't put it, we don't use an encoder like we did at St. Thomas Commencement. Okay. We don't, it's, um, captioning is anything that has a video behind it. So mm-hmm. you got the words on the screen, video behind that. Cart is anything that doesn't have video behind it. Okay. So we can, um, like I can be sitting here, like I said, we could have somebody s- s- over there writing. I would have a separate computer in front of me and I'd be reading what's being said. That's cart. Okay, so that's more for for 
deaf, uh, like I, I would guess more more deaf. Or, or hard of hearing. Or, or hard of hearing. Or? It depends with the, with the deaf world. If you're mm-hmm. capital D deaf, that means that you were born, most likely born deaf and grew up in the deaf culture. Mm-hmm. And then you're most likely going to know sign language. And that's the big thing. And that's why, too, when they came out with cochlear implants, however many years ago, there was a big uproar because um, a lot of the capital D deaf people were upset because they were afraid that they would be losing their culture if more and more people went into take getting... Um, the cochlear implants, uh-huh. because then they would be losing more deaf people. Um, and so that's, and so CART is really, so it really just depends. It, they can be a deaf person who grew up, like I said before, with um, with out sign language, but, you know, had speech therapy and stuff. And then, you know, they know how to read English well. Um, and so this is for people like that. It's okay. also used for, um, we found out since that people, English as a second language. I had an aesthetician once who, when she found out what I did, she says, she's from Russia. That's how I learned English. She watched the TV and was able to learn English. A lot of deaf kids, or a lot of kids of deaf parents um, will have the TV on with captioning. They learn to read faster than regular kids with regular hearing. Really? Because they're watching the TV with words on it. Uh And so they have to to read a certain speed because, Mm -hmm. you know, you got to catch up. Well, and it's there. So, you know, it's why not learn... I don't know what, for whatever reason, kids just pick that up a lot quicker. And I wonder if you've noticed this at all. I feel, and I think there, there has been like some actual statistics behind this, that more people today are watching TV and movies with captioning on. Um, I know like, like captioning on Netflix and everything is like huge. Have you noticed that at all? Do you, do you know anything about that? I really don't know, yeah. but I watch it all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've realized over my lifetime that when I'm not working, I've become a very passive listener. I do not work to listen. <laughs> um, so if I'm out in a bar or, or a restaurant or somewhere and I've been working all day, I'll be like, what? Mm-hmm. What? And so, some, and, and if I'm in the car, I have the radio blasted. Same with the TV because I don't want to have to work to hear. I work to hear all day. I don't want to hear it when I'm out with friends or watching TV. And so people have commented that they think I'm losing my hearing. I'm like, no, I'm uh, no, here's I just am turning it off. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to have to listen. So I watch captioning all the time. And that's why too, I can always tell it's so frustrating and I can't imagine being so if I had to be reliant on that to get my information, you know, and you're looking at the news and you know, they're talking and nothing's coming up Yeah, or it's just jumble. You know, and that just really, it's really frustrating for me. And I can't imagine how people who, who live like that, you know, that's what they depend on to. And two, there's another part of this that's really cool. So back in the day, um, deaf people were, weren't considered very smart because they didn't really know English because they couldn't speak. And they didn't really know how to read because their language is a visual language. And so people just didn't think they were. And in the beginning, when I first started working in this field and I would get an email from a person who was deaf, I'd be like, hmm. you know, there's no punctuation. Hello, I'm an English punctuation yeah. person. Um, but I finally realized they'd never experienced English before. So they didn't know how to read English. They didn't have to. And so for them, captioning has been a real, um, just a real way to get to learn, for them to learn English as well. And how to write an email, how to, how to punctuate. You know, it's just something that they, they never had the opportunity, and never needed it. Because they had their language, and then when they get into the you know the real world or the working world, um, all of a sudden you know they're then they're floundering and people think they're not very smart, yeah. which is quite the contrary. Um, you know they're just as smart as any of the rest of us. Mm-hmm. So well, I, and I'm sure it helps them like get better at writing, like you say, like with emails and everything, like seeing s- seeing stuff written. You know, like you have to. Uh, to I guess I you know as an English person I guess right you have to read to get better at writing right and I guess that's sort of yeah. the same sort of philosophy with that. Um, so you mentioned you are a freelance worker now. Yes. So do you work for like a a company and then like they give you jobs or are you doing it yourself or? Yeah, I'm actually associated with a company. Um, the story there is uh, when I left Care Eleven or when I was told to leave Care 11. Mm-hmm. Um, I was then looking to start on my own and, and start, but you know, nobody knew about this. So I was still doing depots. Um, I then met um, who, a woman who became my partner, um, Jan Bauman. And 
then she had another um, colleague that they'd worked together as a court reporting firm. So we put together a firm, the three of us. And I was the captioner person, but we were still building it. So I was lucky to have them to do depots and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, th then we merged with two other court reporting firms and became Paradigm Reporting and Captioning. And we were, um, uh, I think we were together for like 10 or so years. And then Jan had become our managing partner and some of us were kind of getting tired of some of that other stuff. And I was still just running the cart and captioning on my own anyway. Um, and so, short story, we sold out to Jan. She then sold a few years later to a national organization. So we are now part of Veritext. Mm -hmm. I don't know the rest of the name of it. Um, but we call it Veritext. I call it Veritext slash Paradigm. Because so many of my clients know Paradigm. And mm -hmm. they're, not, they're starting to learn Veritext. It's been a few years. So we're getting them there. But So I still run the cart and captioning department for our local firm here. Um, yeah, and so I get to pick the jobs. That's awesome. I know, I love that part. And then how many, I guess, how many people, how many captioners um, do you have in the, in the firm? Not enough. We could use more. Right now, there's four, there are four of us that do CART and captioning because you need special software to do the captioning like you saw at St. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Um, and then we have one person who does a lot of our CART. So there's five of us within the firm, and then we have some overflow people, some that just do remote only, um, and then some that will go on site as well. You know, one of our colleagues, uh, she actually works in court during the day, and so she'll, she helps us out at night or on the weekend sometimes because she, especially with the legislature, she helped us a lot with that, which we really needed the help yeah. on um, because we went late a uh, lot of nights this session. It's been an interesting session. Oh, but, I, yeah, it seems like it's been. Yeah, and so, but, so we're turning down work. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you, we, haven't, we don't really track it because I don't want to know, but it's a little scary because we are turning down work um, because we don't have enough people out there. Our court reporters... Uh, the court reporting side of our business is turning down. They're not so much turning down work, but they're scraping at the end of the day to find somebody for the next day, whether it be, you know, a shorthand or a cart writer or a voice writer. Um, we're just really scrambling, trying to get people to fill the jobs. And there's just a huge need out there. And it's a really good job. Um, you make good money, too. Sometimes you got to... People, that used to be the first question I'd always get when I would talk to students. Well, how much money do you make? And I'm like, well, how hard do you want to work? You know, and it's like any job. If you put in into it what you want out of it, you're going to get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're just kind of, you know, going through the motions, you might not get so much. But um, I think I was telling you earlier that some of the, I was looking up some things so that I would have something to talk about. And there are court reporters who have gone, you know, they've traveled around the world to jobs in the four corners, everywhere. Um, I actually know a person, I've worked with him on some conventions around the country, and he actually goes to Guantanamo Bay and is doing the depots down there for the people that are imprisoned there. And I don't know if they're all still 9-11 people or what, but there's a, a whole group of people that go down there um, still regularly, like every other month, and he's there for a month. Um, you know, so there's just, there are so many things we can do. Some of the other things I've do, I've captioned the Dalai Lama three times, <laughs> three times. He is so cool. Um, it was so interesting. You know, the things we've, I've, I think I said, I mentioned, I captioned a wedding for a friend. I've captioned funerals. Um, the fun part is I captioned for the wild mm -hmm. in the stadium, um, the Timberwolves and the Lynx, um, MNUFC, the, the loons. And then I also caption go for football in the stadium. So I get to be at all of these places watching the games. The Timberwolves and Lynx were down in the cellar kind of, but you still, you still get You're to still be there. there. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so those are, it's really, some of the stuff we do is just so much fun. Um, that you're like, okay, I have, I have to go to work. All I have to go to the wild game, you know, oh, oh bummer, poor me. Pity me. Yeah. Uh, the, the worst part of that is it's so cold that we have yeah. to, even though know, we're going in on an 80 degree day in the fall and in the spring. And yet I'm wearing my big bulky mm -hmm. jacket and I've got yeah. my hand warmers and everything. Cause we're sitting right under a, an air conditioning, but it's still, it's a blast, um, just to get, and I've really learned a lot about hockey. I was always a football fan. Mm -hmm. Um, Never so much a hockey fan, but now I'm a hockey fan. Well, there you go. So, yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. We need some more fans. <laughs> I know. Well, we just, they need to start playing better. Yeah, yeah, the wild do. They, they need to, <laughs> I could go in, uh, that's a whole other episode right there. <laughs> okay. um, so, what do you think has been the, the coolest moment for you while doing this job? Oh, wow. 
You've already mentioned a few awesome ones. There are so many. I mean, I've captioned uh, Joe Biden when he was vice president. He came here for a DFL dinner. Um, Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders. Um, I I can't even... Oh, I was thinking of this. I can't remember... Oh, gosh. This was way back, and one of my colleagues worked with me on it. Um, it, Carl Reiner. And who used to work with Carl Reiner? There was another comedian that they had this show, The Caveman or something. And they were in town, and it was a fundraiser. And they had us caption it. It's like, seriously? Are you kidding? They were crazy. But at one point, they were standing right behind us, and they're like, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, well, we're captioning you when you... Oh, well, we're going to make it fun, you know? And, yeah. but so I got to, I didn't actually get to meet them, but I got to talk to them. So mm-hmm. I always felt that was kind of cool. Um, I, well, I, there've been so many great times. I got to go to Las Vegas in the beginning. Um, when they first started the Jerry, Jerry Lewis telethon, um, used to be on every Labor Day and f- they decided to start captioning that, and they captioned like the first 16 hours and then the last 16 hours. They flew me out to Las Vegas, comped my hotel room, um, and I got to bring a colleague with me. One year I brought my mom, another year I brought a colleague because I needed somebody to split it up with. And we sat there and captioned for the, and at one point it was Robin Williams and Billy Crystal from Paris. Oh, wow. That was not fun. It was fun, but it was not fun. Um, there was somebody else who, who would do a funny rendition of singing the national anthem with the echo. That was really fun. So, I mean, there's some things that are just like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? But yet it's so much fun to be a part of it. You know, Mm -hmm. I get to say we captioned one of the first telecasts for the Jerry Lewis telethon. You know, that's that was pretty cool. There are some other things that I I just I was trying to make a list of them today and I can't remember them all. I've captioned a rodeo. Oh, a rodeo outside. An outdoor rodeo, an outdoor rodeo sitting outside under a tent. Oh, yeah, wow. they, they put up a tent for me. They had fans for me and everything. And I sat there and, and I didn't have any audio. Usually I have it, my headphones on or you saw mm-hmm. I have my headphones with an audio connection. Um, nope. I just, all I could do was hear what was being said. And so I just captioned it and it was for one person. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, That's... it was really fun. It was interesting. I'm not so much a rodeo person, yeah. but it was, you know, to be able to do that. And this person got to really enjoy the show which they'd never had before. And it legitimately was your first rodeo. It was. <laughs> good one, There Scott. we go. Yeah, that yeah. was a good one. It was, it was hanging there, you know. It, for um, you it was, yes, yeah. Yes. Me, no, no. <laughs> right over my head. So we have this, um, your equipment here, I think. Yeah. We'll, uh, you know, show show what, what it's got. Um, all righty. Man, what do, I, what do I talk about here? Um, <laughs> so I guess... Um, if you want to explain what you're doing while you're where you're going, um, so you're using these keys here, which are very pretty, by the way. Thank you. All decorated. It's from Etsy. Etsy. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Of course. So, um, so this is a Steno machine, mm-hmm. um, and this is a Luminex, which is made by one of the companies. There are several different variations of them. Um, it's the one I like because I like the touch. Mm-hmm. So everybody has a different touch, different feel. I used to be where pound, 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 and now I try to go lighter because it's easier on my on my fingers and my thumbs. Um, but so yeah, I'm just writing. I was just writing things in Steno. Oops. Yes. So you could see how it comes up in English. So I don't know if you can see this. Yep. Uh-huh. But so that's the steno. Okay. And so that TPH right there, mm-hmm. that means in. Really? So, okay. Yeah. But by themselves, so then the TP by themselves uh-huh. would be an F. So how many keys are, are there on this? Oh, man, I always forget. Um, like 20, 22 or something like that. So do you have like... Um, I guess macros for each, for each, uh, entry. No entry. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, okay. So entry comes up. So there's that. Mm, let's see. Mm, I can't for each. Let me, let me do that again for each entry. Okay. So the FPLT mm-hmm. right there is a period. Okay. And it's just stuff we have to learn. Um, over here, the S, P-W-R-A-O-E, that's the word entry. So, yeah, we do write a lot of things in one stroke. Um, but so like bill for an act, the thing that the legislator, legislator guys say all the mm-hmm. time. So there's a bill for an act, blah, blah, blah. Bokt, B-O-K-T. 
And then I can, tr- I put that into my dictionary is if I write this, it means bill for an act. Okay. That's how we do a lot of stuff. Um, I also have different, mm, different keys or different strokes for, um, people's names. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't think of anybody right now. Um, but that way I, you know, so that if I'm in a job, I can designate easier than trying to write out their whole name every time. I just have like a, a one or two stroker, um, that, or I can bring up like, if I want applause, if I want to show that they're applauding. Oh, uh-huh, yeah. Oh, did I come out right? Applause. So I write applause, applause. Mm-hmm. And it comes okay. Out. So it's like, I think I, I was describing it before as, um, it's kind of like playing the piano. Mm-hmm. We've got that keyboard and you, you play single keys sometimes for single notes, or you can also have chords. Yes. And that's where you have more than one or two keys. Um, and you do a chord. And that's basically what we do here. There are some keys that, like the T by, the, by itself is the, but it's also a T if I add something, another stroke to it. Okay. Um, and so then that, you know, but then I can also make chords or mm-hmm. macros as we call them. There are so many, and it's funny because everybody has different ways of doing it. It's just you need to be able to remember it because you can't write them all down. Mm-hmm. So we have to remember all of that stuff. And when it's said, we have to remember, okay, how do I write that? I write it like this. And especially with carton captioning, um, we can't have like the three, like the homonyms, the three theirs is always my mm-hmm. favorite one. Um, you know, T-H-E-R-E and then E-I-R. And I can't remember the other one. At the, uh, the T- T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E? No, that's a whole different stroke because that's they are. So then... It's a contraction. Uh-huh. But anyway, uh, so yeah, we have the three theirs. And we have to know which one they're going to say. It used to be back in the day when, when we were doing, like when I was doing depositions and stuff, I could write just, I'd have THR was my there. Pretty yeah. Pretty obvious. Um, and then you it would... not need to no. be correct. And it would come up in my computer system. It would come up in little parentheses as a, as a pick it. You know, you pick which one you want. Mm-hmm. And then, too, as the computers got better, they would start to learn, okay, this is when she, when this kind of grammar is coming up, this is the there I need. So I didn't always have to worry about it. But when I started doing carton captioning, I actually had um, a person who was doing it at the time, and he was also a trainer. And he came and he went through my dictionary. It, w- that's what we call where we store all mm-hmm. of our entries. Yeah. Um, and he came and went through my dictionary, made me go through my dictionaries and First, I had to take out all the swear words. I did a lot of work for public defender in Florida. And so we got a lot of interesting people that would come in. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't all me. It was, it was the, off, the law enforcement officer saying it. It was the people. <laughs> you weren't just adding in. the swear words for fun. No, I didn't do that yeah. just for fun. But um, yeah, so it was pretty funny because I, I apparently had the most F words of anybody in the country at oh, that time there you go. in my dictionary. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, I was real proud of that. Yeah. I'm like, it's not my fault. Um, but, and I lost my train of thought. But yeah, so um, we, yeah, no, I lost my train of thought. Um, okay, so these, um, so so on average, to write one word, how many keys are you pressing? I guess you, 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 you've you kind of explained that it's different for a lot of words, but I guess on average, like. There is no, because each one is different. Mm-hmm. Like English to me is two strokes, but somebody else might have it as one stroke. Um, because a lot of people, I'm trying to think so Per, perform for me is just one stroke, mm-hmm. um, whereas for other people it's two. I'm trying to think. There have been some things going around that are. Uh, we have a Facebook page that a lot of us go to for yeah, briefs yeah. and things like that. And and how do you write this? You know, I've been in this job and it's we're doing this all day, and everybody's like, "Well, hello, this." And then I'm looking at it, going, "Oh, wow, that's pretty cool." Um, yeah. So it just it it really depends on your style first mm-hmm. of all what you were taught in school way back in the day or or now coming up and then what what works for you like a lot of the briefs that work for some of my colleagues are totally backwards from what i do um and it but it gives me ideas on okay well i can't do that cuz that's already something else but i could do this and then and it makes sense to me so i'm going to remember it we've got if, for instance to one of the girls that one of the women that works with me um she went through the 2020s to mm-hmm. get us one strokers instead of having to write 2020 or 2020 because that can be awkward yeah um and using the number bar isn't always our favorite and um so she went through and has a whole list of them and so now we've got one strokers for let me see if that's what i think it is 2024 wow yeah it, instead of having to write it 2024 which i always mess up because i didn't learn the number bar when I went to mm-hmm. school. I would always okay. write out all my numbers. So do so I guess every every person has their own style. Yes. Is there um 
kind of a consensus way that it is taught in, in schools? You know, I'm or- so far removed from schools these mm-hmm. days, but there are certain theories in each school. Um, and for instance, we have a really great school here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, or it's actually in Anoka. It's called Anoka Tech. And I'm going to give Scout the, um, the website address and also then there's um another it's on screen right here yeah it's gonna be on screen <laughs> and, sorry it's not on screen right now but it will be um yes. and then also i have the name so anoka technical school has a court reporting and a captioning program um court reporting program actually also has um some online you're able to do online or hybrid or or on site um captioning i think is a little different but um yeah so there's i totally got off your question though but um and so I'll also give Scout the name of the director of the captioning division for the school so that people can reach out. And I also want to make sure I tell tell this. So September 7th at Anoka Tech, and it might be online too, I'm not quite sure, but there's a free program. It's every Monday night for six weeks. It's called A to Z. And the schools even have machines for you to rent or just to even use while you're there so that you can get an idea, so that people can come and get an idea of, Am I even going to be any good at this? Generally, if you've played a, a, a band instrument or the piano or, you know, you're good with it, you can type well, um, you're probably going to have the dexterity for it. And it's, it's so cool. But um, so they have this program, A to Z. You come in, you try it out, you see if you like it or not. You don't even have to go past the first night if you don't want to. But if you want to, go through all six nights, you know, six weeks. I think it's a two-hour class for six weeks every Monday, and you get an idea if you're going to like it or not. And then you can you know, sign up for school, or you can sign up and do it online. Um, so we're just trying to really get the word out and make it easier for people mm-hmm. to know about this really cool career that, by the way, we need people. We don't have enough people to employ. Yeah. So, and I totally went away from your question yet again. <laughs> no, I totally <laughs> forgot my question anyway. So, um, so how have you seen this machine and this system changed throughout your career. <laughs> now you're really going to date me. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Scout. Yes, of course. Of um, course. Okay, so I uh, started, I went to court reporting school uh, two weeks after I graduated high school in 1974. 74, yeah. And um, at that time, we had no computers. Um, we had these silly little machines that you had to pound on mm-hmm. to get the, the words to go. Um, and... And then we sat in, in classes and took audio dictation from a teacher because, you know, they would use tape recorders, but you couldn't hear the audio wasn't that good. So, yeah, we had teachers that would dictate to us all the time. Um, we had to type things with carbon paper. Carbon paper? I knew you were going to say that. It's, <laughs> um, so we'd have a one, one piece of regular mm-hmm. stationery, say, and then there was a, a carbon paper behind it, which when you hit it, it's like a typewriter ribbon. Mm-hmm. Um, only this was paper, and it would you would hit it, and it would put the letter on the paper. Okay, yeah. So that's how we made copies in those days. Mm-hmm. We didn't necessarily have copy machines in those days. I remember when I was um, getting ready to graduate from court reporting school, I had a, I was an intern. Uh, I don't know what I was called, but I was at Fagre and Benson, one of the law firms at the time, mm-hmm. and they had offices down in Florida, and so that's how I knew, too, where Sarasota was, which yeah. is where I was moving to, because nobody knew where Sarasota was. It was on the West Coast. Nobody knew about so it, no, no, but it was no, south no. of um, Tampa, St. Pete, and we had one of the first fax machines, but it was one of those you had to sit there and make sure it was working and roll it a little bit, so... Um, yeah, and then we eventually started in computers. I'm trying to remember. I think that was like in mm, early 80s, 79, 80. And um, yeah, because we had to sit there and train the computer then to to read all of our steno. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet we were still working every day. And so we were having to type up our car, our, paper, our transcripts and then sit with the computer at night and, and figure out how it worked. And then once that got going, but the computers in those days were huge. And in fact, when I came up here to do cart, we were still using one of these huge, it, um, just the keyboard itself, which is what the actual uh, board was. I can't think of the name. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that weighed 50 pounds. Oh, wow. And then I had to carry the monitor. 
and then there was the power. So it was now no easy feat getting around, and mm -hmm. yet we had to go places because we didn't have the remote. There was no internet back in those yeah. days either. Um, yeah, we used to call libraries all the time asking for spellings or trying to figure out words that oh, people yeah. had said. Yeah, so once we got the internet, it was like, whoa, you know, we can, I can just do a Google and say, how do you spell huh. this word? Instead of having to call the library. Are you a pretty good speller? Sometimes. <laughs> I used to be. Today, I couldn't spell ludicrous. I kept spelling it with, okay. it was the word ludicrous, not the name. Uh -huh. And I kept trying to spell the name. And then I would get mad at my autocorrect because it kept autocorrecting, mm -hmm. putting the capital L on. I'm like, no. And I was on the phone with my admin and he's like, Lisa, it's spelled like this. Oh, whoops. <laughs> so apparently I'm not such yes. a good speller anymore. Yes. But I do tend to um, proofread when I'm reading. I read a lot of books. I've always been a reader. Um, but I do tend to proofread books when I read them. Really? So you you go through and mm. I kinda, don't do it. I it's just, that English major. Yeah, it's an English, and I I I didn't go to high, uh, college or anything. Mm -hmm. I just went to this business school. But we did have a lot of classes in English, um, and we have to learn how to punctuate. Yeah. But that's really what I criticize in books, and it's only silently to myself because I'm just like, okay, somebody needs to proofread this. <laughs> right, yeah. Because it comes, sometimes can be hard to understand. I mean, you put a comma in the wrong place, it can change the meaning of the sentence. Definitely. We found that out, you know, doing trial work and stuff. It was like, whoa, did he say this or did he? And it's sometimes the inflection of people's voices. You know, we always had the, what was it, the Valley Girls who would always end up on a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, And so you're like, okay, do I put a period or a question mark? You know, uh -huh. so some of this stuff is kind of weird. But yeah, I've seen a lot of changes. And, and the technology we have today is just unbelievable. I could be, we could be sitting here and if somebody wanted to know what we were saying, I could be streaming it over the internet to somebody uh -huh. over in Africa. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. Well, everybody knows what the technology is, but for our field, it has just been amazing it's a huge boon for us. Makes work a lot easier and a lot more fun too, because now I get to work with people all over the place. Yeah, yeah, and people get to see your work all over the place too. And people get to know what's happening. Yes. In the meetings that they're in. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned that you fill out a dictionary for your um, for for your yourself. So how big, how large is your dictionary? Would you say? Well. Um, can look. I we can look. I can pull it up. So. 294,726 entries. 200. Oh, wow. And that's in my main dictionary. I also have jobs. So each job has a job dictionary. Uh -huh. um, I like it that way because that way, if I'm working with St. Thomas, I've got all my St. Thomas stuff in that dictionary. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm working for the University of Minnesota, um, and they have so many different things, so I'll have different, their different schools. Football, you know. Their yeah, football, yeah, yeah. And then the different schools for their commencements, mm -hmm. the thing, the Humphrey School, the, yeah, yeah. the veterinary school. Um, yeah. And then, and then there's a couple of dictionaries, little dictionaries in there that have all my um, controls for if I want to clear the screen for captions, if I want to move the captions up to the top instead of being at the bottom. Okay. I can control all of that from my keyboard. Oh, wow. With my dictionaries. Yeah. That is really interesting. So I guess d what, what, did, did you start off with your dictionary by copying someone else's, I guess, and then going from there and figuring out your own? No. Uh, well, I learned a certain theory in, in court reporting school. Mm -hmm. um, I call it the long A theory because that was the only long vowel we had. And then all of a sudden when they started coming in with what they called computer compatible theory, that had the long, long vowels. Um, I happened to be, I had a scopist at the time. So a scopist is where I would um, go through, I would take it all, and put it on a floppy disk, mm -hmm. uh -huh, <laughs> and yes. um, then I would go through it. Actually, I would just put it on there and give it to her, and she would then she would go through and edit the transcript for me, and then I would proofread it when she was done. Um, and she was taking computer-compatible court reporting theory at the time, mm -hmm. and so she helped me learn some of the stuff that I didn't know. Um, and, then, and then at the same time, too, I'm trying to program this new computer system. I, what's a computer, you know? And um, so... That's where, so mine is, people look at mine and they're like, huh? Because it's, it's really a, a mismatch, you know, it's, or it's a crossover kind of, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. It's kind of a mashup of a, a, several different people telling me or helping yeah. me how to do it or things that I've picked up along the way that I've wanted to change. Yeah. And I'm sure you've um, met some interesting people, I guess, or people who do things totally differently than you. Yeah. There's a couple, they came out with books on how to do this after I'd been yeah, doing yeah. it for a of couple course, years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So because I was a station, right? And um, 
and so, yeah, they do everything completely backwards from how I do. So, like, we have four different alphabets. For, well, there's more than that these days. But when we first started, there were four different alphabets. So, um, which means I have w one alphabet for a standalone letter. So I can just put T, and the T will just stand there by itself. I can have T with a period and a space so that, I, like, say, Scout T Mason. Mm -hmm. you know, And then I could have the T there with a period. Um, and then I'm trying to think what else. Then there's the stitching. So if somebody spells a word, so they'll say the word, and then they spell it. Well, we need to do that. So I have a, a alphabet then for each, each letter has a hyphen so that it tags up to the next letter. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is, um, oh, if I want to finger spell something, like say I didn't know how to spell your name, I could spell it, I could just spell it myself, S-C-O-U-T. All of those letters would tag together. Um, for me, the way I do that, I start out with the first, so my letters all take up to the thing that comes after them. The theory that most of my colleagues have is they take up to the thing that's before them. Okay. And I'm like, huh? I mean, that to me would be really messy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't know how they do it, but that's what they were taught. Yeah. And I had to figure it out for myself. And that's, and so then that's what this book teaches too. It's like it, everything is completely opposite of how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Well, apparently yeah, I'm yeah. just that weird. So, <laughs> so do you have to switch keyboards throughout? Like, I guess, cause if you, I, I guess I'm a little confused on like if you're sp finger spelling, you said like mm -hmm. spelling things just directly out. Um, do you have to, to switch your type of keyboard so you're nope. not doing macros or no, no, it's just everything. Um, no, everything is just done right from here. We don't mm -hmm. switch anything out. Um, occasionally, sometimes if I see I've made a mistake and I think that's going to come up again during the meeting or whatever I'm doing, I'll quick reach over mm -hmm. and do a, what we call a global. It's just, it means we're going to, I just put the, the mistakes together and then put it in my dictionary the okay. way it's supposed to be. So that's the only time I wouldn't be using, wouldn't be like during a meeting, that's the only time that I might take my hands off this keyboard, the steno keyboard, because that's where they need to be. Okay. Yeah. For so, do you are you switching different dictionaries throughout like a meeting then or? No, nope, they're all so. I, so they're all in one. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. So they're they, depending on the job, I might have as many as four or five, mm -hmm. um, and then and they're listed in the order of what comes first. So if I've got a job dictionary for something, um, and they might have like a lot of mm, Rochelle. That's a name that can be spelled. A million, well, my name can be, Lisa can be spelled a million different ways. Mm -hmm. So if I've got somebody in this particular school that has, this class always has Lisa spelled L-E-E-S-A. And I can't put that in my main dictionary because there's so many, so many ways you can write it too to get it to come up um, without, inter, without having the wrong Lisa come up. And I've had people complain that I didn't spell their names right. Of course. It's like, yeah. well, okay, I don't know candy with an I, sorry. Um, but and so I will make a job dictionary and then I'll put that spelling every which way till Sunday in that job dictionary so that it comes up only in that job dictionary. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it might come up in another one, another job that I'm doing without, and I might finger spell it then. Um, but yeah, so that's, they, it goes through in order of, of the order that I've told it to be in. This, check this one first, this one, this one, this one. And then when in doubt, use the main one. So... Have you had times, does it, I'm sure it gets stressful, but have you had times where it's like you're crumbling down, you're really trying to catch up? Yeah. Um, there's one story when I was um, still doing court reporting down in Florida, that three-day job I told you about, one of the days it made me cry. Um, now, this is back in the 70s. You have to remember that, late 70s. And um, we were taking the doctor's deposition. He was super defensive. Um, he was one of the doctors that was being sued super, super defensive. And he was talking faster than I'm talking. Um, I've always realized I do talk fast, can't help it. Um, and so I do give people some grace there, but this doctor, I had, I had stopped him. I can't tell you how many times. And there were three attorneys in the room, two of whom were friends. And one, I just knew a lot. He'd been a doctor and then went in, went back to law school and became a medical plaintiff's attorney. Um, mm -hmm. nice guy too, but this doctor just I, I couldn't keep up. And I finally, it was after half an hour or 45 minutes, I finally threw up my hands and I said, you guys, I can't do this. You got to call somebody else. I can't. I, I, doctor, I, you can't. You got to slow down. I can't understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And, and um, 
They're like, Lisa, if you can't do it, nobody can. I said, yeah, well, I can't do it. So you're going to have to call somebody else. And they're like, well, let's go out in the hall. <laughs> so yeah. we went out in the hall. We're in the middle of a hospital. And um, I smoked at the time. And so did the attorneys. And so we all lit up a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> because I just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And it was so stressful. Um, so sometimes we run into stuff like that. We run into that a lot with carton captioning. Um, people are talking faster and faster. Uh, it's not unusual for us, um, for a lot of the things we do, like with the legislature, 250 words a minute. And it's not continuous, but there can be long, there used to be maybe that was like just one little streak that went, you know, for a minute. Mm -hmm. And then people would go back to their regular speaking. Um, One of the shows we captioned is Almanac on TPT. They talk, it's gotten faster and faster every year. These days, it's not unusual to look up and see they're talking 350, 400 words a minute. And then we get a total count at the end of the show. Um, Lately, all of us have been comparing notes. There's four of us that do that show. And we've been comparing notes, and it's like we're doing 200 for the hour. So it compares, it takes the whole hour, 266 to 280 words per minute for the whole show. Because oh, wow. there, there are no commercials there. There's a couple breaks. We get a little bit of script. Mm-hmm. The rest of it, it's political. You know, it's, uh, it's just like it's starting to blow us away. And I don't know what we're going to do because, well, we'll just keep getting better and better, I guess, because <laughs> we have to. But, yeah, it's really been interesting the last – I'd say five or so years, mm-hmm. people are talking faster and faster. And we can't quite figure out, okay, is it this generation? Um, is it this? We, we haven't been able to figure that part out yet. Yeah. Well, I think something that's interesting that I watched like a YouTube video on was like, because so many people are able to watch anyone from anywhere, like, uh, you know, you can watch someone on YouTube from, um, you know, Great Britain your whole life, but you're sitting in Louisiana, right? Um, or like you, you, there's so much more access to people with different accents right. and everything. Maybe that has something to do with it because like I, I, I watched, like I said, I watched this video that was like in a few years where there's going to be no accents because people are going to be so oh. exposed to different accents that it's all going to like kind of come together a little bit. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to research that. Yeah, yeah. And I don't have an accent. I'm like, oh, am I the one of the first? <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't have an accent? I, I'm from North Carolina. I don't. I think every once in a while the, the little southern twang will come uh-huh. out, you know, on certain words. But I wouldn't say. I, I'd say I'm pretty. I don't know. I, I don't think I have an accent. I don't know. I don't think I do either, do I? I think a little Minnesotan. <laughs> okay. I think so. Yeah. Well, I've been back here for a long time. So. Yeah. Yeah. You're around it. So, yeah. um, and that's where you're from. I would love yeah. to have like a real Southern, Southern boy accent, you know, but I did come back talking with, with some, with, and I still say y'all. Oh, oh, and that's people look at me. the greatest word. Well, it, it's so all it all encompassing instead of you guys. I or, know that's kind of these days, especially it's a little sexist. So, you know, y'all come on, yeah. y'all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm noticing more and more people are using that even in their emails mm-hmm. and things like that. So, oh yeah. I use it cool. all the time. And it was like the first thing people, uh, oh, you're not from here. And I was like, how do you know? You just <laughs> said y'all. What do you mean? Or if you say miss. <laughs> Oh, you yes. Know, you're talking to someone and you say, yes, sir, yes, sir or yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I, I say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, all the time, and that's a tale. To, sometimes, like, people will be like, what are you saying? Like, like get, like, mad at me, and I'm like, I don't know. My mom told me my mom, like, yeah. would kill me if I wasn't, you know? That's how it is in the South. Yeah, yeah, you know, that it really is. is. And I've picked up a little bit, but I find myself saying, ma'am, and it's like I'm talking to a guy. I'm like, oops, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So I find myself doing that sometimes, too. It's just being polite. Oh, yeah. No. Well, it's just like that's just how I was raised, you know, and oh. I do did. I did make the like mistake when I, I worked at a restaurant. So like I every once in a while, it's like you're, you're I'm you know, you're going yeah. and the, the restaurant's busy and uh, can I get another glass of wine? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sir. Yes, sir. And then like hopefully they're not, you know, in a bad mood or anything. Hopefully well, you're getting that glass of wine to them a little bit quicker, right? There is that. Yeah. I mean, but I think most people are understanding uh, no, about yeah, that too. Yeah. No, it's, it's just, just a slip. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, I guess what has kept you in this business for so long? I really love it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are days, there are meetings that I don't love and it's just like, Oh, come on, just be done now. Just shut up, please. Um, I should, probably shouldn't tell anybody that, but um, I just, I really love, the biggest thing is I love being on the keyboard. I love writing. Um, I, I just love writing it in steno and seeing it come up in English. And I'm still shooting for the perfect show. Okay, I've been doing this for how long? Since, um, when did I come back? 88? I'm still shooting for the perfect show. I've had close. Mm-hmm. Um, 
every once in a while on Almanac, I'll get to like quarter to 10 to, so it's like 50 minutes and I've got another five minutes left and I've got no one translates. Nothing, everything is translated. You know, there might've still been some mistakes in it here and there, but the, everything has translated. And, you know, and I'm just like, okay, just ignore it. Just keep going with the show. And then sure enough, I'll look a minute later and there's an untranslate. And it's like, <laughs> seriously, really? Yeah. Um, but I found that's, that's true with my colleagues too. We're all kind of in the same boat. Um, but I, you know, and some of the things we do, I mean, I've already said, you know, I get to go watch go for football games. Bummer. I mean, that just <laughs> is such a hardship. Um, you know, just the things we've done, you know, we just, to know that people, um, I, I often will get this too. There was, I did a, an awards show, a Minnesota book awards show. We do a lot of work for the different libraries as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh gosh, I forgot all about that. We've captioned tons of authors. I can't even begin Oh, I'm sure. It's like, yeah, yeah cuz we used to do the um the shows at the Fitzgerald, the talking volumes, and since COVID that hasn't come back yet, uh, but I'm hoping it will. But we still do them for the um, Friends of the uh, Hennepin County Public Library. And they have uh, um in the spring and in the fall they do two day it's a night and a day of different authors. I mean, um I'm trying to think was it Dan Rather that was there once? I mean, just some of the Yeah, but you know, we just always get people who I, I people will come up and thank us. One guy used to sit next to me at the Wild. He was one of the workers there. He was at the Minnesota Book Awards. And he had no clue. He, I, I saw him standing there, and I, I was like, is that Wandy? Because I hadn't seen him outside of the Wild. Mm -hmm. you know. And I'm looking at him. And he came over to ask the audio guy. And he said, um, how are you doing the captions up there? Is that you know, artificial intelligence? And the audio guy, bless his heart, he says, no. They wouldn't do it. It's her. And he, he's like, oh, and he recognized, he was, and he was just, he's like, it was my daughter insisted I come, but I knew I wouldn't be able to hear anything. And then there were captions. He said, I was able to understand what was going on. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to do this? You know, I, the women, the two women that were crying and that made me cry. I will never forget that. The, my friend's wedding. Um, and one of our colleagues just did another wedding this last Saturday that I have not been able to check on yet to see how it went. Yeah. But, you know, just to know that other people get to participate in life because they can see what's being said. I, that's why I'm going to have a hard time quitting because, mm -hmm. um, I, my thumbs are starting to wear out and that's the, it's like the bummer part of it. But I really, I love being on the machine and I love some of the stuff we get to do. I've learned so much from this job. I can't begin to tell you the things I've learned and seen and, and how it's changed my life. Um, because I can go out now go and tell people, this is what's happening at the legislature. So if you want to make an impact, you better call your legislator. Mm -hmm. you know, it, and some listen, some don't. But then later on, they're like, I wish I'd listened. Or, whoa, that, you, know, you knew that was going to happen. I'm like, yeah, I did. Because I, I, I had to listen to it. I didn't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I love about it the most. And that's what I'm trying. I really would love to get across to people what a wonderful job this is. Um, yeah, there are hard days. But there are hard days in anything you do. I'm sure you find that as oh, well. Yeah. Um, I can't tell. I, I mean, being a nurse would be really fulfilling I, as well. But it's different. Um, this is just something where you really get to help people. You get to see the, you get to see a student progress through college or even we don't really do elementary or high school um, because I think the reading level is a little different. But once they get into college or, or whatever, um, you know, you can see them the, follow the progression. And that to me is just that means everything. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, we get paid for it and we get paid kind of well too. Just, just saying. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm hoping I'm, I was, there were some touch points I wanted to make sure I hit. I hit about Jennifer and Anoka Tech, um, and the A to Z program, the free school for, you know, six weeks. Um, I just, you know, something, pass it around, tell people, uh, we're just constantly looking for people. We need, we need more people to fill the job and it's a, just a really fun life. And you get to dictate most of the time your own hours. So. Can't beat that, right? I don't think so. Yeah. Well, I, I love how passionate you are about it. And I think that's that's the best part, right? And when, when you find something you love to do, you never have to work a day in your life, right? Yeah, I, you're right. That's it. And this is, I really believe this is what I was born to do. That's amazing. I lucked into it, so. Final question. What is your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Oh, the Harry Potter movies. Really? Harry Potter. Did, did yeah. you read them too? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't read them twice yet. Mm -hmm. I'm saving that for when I retire because I have all of the books and then I also have the DVD set. 
Yeah, I'm kind of a, I'm a little weirdo. I love Harry. Um, the first book, though, that I read when yeah. I was younger that I remember that I fell in love with was The Hobbit. Oh, wow. And The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I, in a way, I'm a, I'm a mild sci-fi person. Yes. That's kind of... And I like the Star Wars and stuff, but I'm kind of out of that. And Star... Oh, Star Trek, the original Star the original Trek that Star was on Trek. TV. Yep. Yep. The Trouble with Tribbles. Of course. Sorry. Wow. I know I'm such That's a nerd. That's awesome. Well, hey... <laughs> I'm a nerd too, just in different ways, right? Yeah. Everyone's got their own little nerdiness. Great question, um, though. But yeah, no, I I dressed up as Harry Potter for Halloween. I I actually wear my I have glasses, I have contacts, but I have glasses, round ones. Whoa. And every time I wear my glasses, so you look like Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah, I I got it. <laughs> and so I, I was like, well, it. I got to, like, Why I got to do it, you know? Yeah. This is, well, yeah I'll oh do God, that one. I know. <laughs> call it a day. The the imagination behind those books, right? You know, mm -hmm. or. Or Tolkien's, you know, the the trilogy and The Hobbit, and I don't know where those writers. I wish I could be like that, because part of me always wanted to be a writer when I grew up. But yeah. I just write this now. Well, there you so, go. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you for coming on, and I think. Thank you for having it's, me. It's it's awesome. I think everyone will learn a lot, and I appreciate it. Well, I hope so. I really do appreciate the opportunity, Scout. It was when you first said it, I was just like, eh. but um, <laughs> I thought about, it, and I'm really glad, and it was just because it's been such a pleasure to meet you and get yeah. to know you a bit better too. So thank you for having me. Yes, of course. Alrighty. Cool. All set.